Hello, and welcome to Tennis Stories. I'm your host, Danisha Boston Hill, head of NJTL Strategic Partnerships and Events at USTA Eastern. Today, we have a special episode, and we're joined by some heavy hitters in the USTA Eastern section, and that's New York, New Jersey, and parts of Connecticut. So please join me in welcoming the one, the only, Art Carrington, Bob Bynum, and Marvin Dent. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today. Glad to be here. Thank you for having us. You're very welcome. Glad to be here. And so this is, we're celebrating Black history 365 days a year. And we're coming upon just, you know, always, you know, reinventing how the message is presented to the community about tennis and African Americans within the tennis, um, in the tennis world. And so you, I, I met some of you over the past year when I joined USTA Eastern, and I'm just really excited about today's chit chat that we're going to have because you are a wealth of knowledge and information, and I, and I'm really just excited. I have like chills. You know, you've shared some of your stories with me when I met you in person or spoke to you over the phone but I'm ready to share with the world. And so we're gonna kick it off with Art. Art, I'd like to really just introduce yourself um, and tell the world just a little bit about who you are and how fabulous you are, Art Covington, Carrington. Well, you know, I've been in the game of tennis for uh, 66 of my 76 years. And so uh, I was a member of one of the oldest and first um, Black tennis clubs in Elizabeth, New Jersey. And um, I went to Hampton University and I was an ATA champ and I graduated from Hampton. And I've been coaching tennis since 1969. So that's just a little quickie. That's fantastic. And so because of your contributions and, you know, we're, we're looking at Black History Month um, and what it means to the local tennis community. So we're going to head over to Bob Bynum and please introduce yourself, Bob, and tell the world about who you are. Uh, yeah, my name is Bob Bynum. I wear a lot of different hats. I'm a teaching pro. I'm a college coach. I'm a junior team tennis coordinator. I, I uh, direct programs for a nonprofit organization. Uh, I do a lot, wear a lot of different hats. I was going to put them all on for this, but then my face, there wouldn't have been any room for my face here. So um I started playing tennis at late in life, as tennis goes, at 14 years old, uh, public parks in Newark, New Jersey, Weequay Park. As a matter of fact, of this, of the three of us on this call, I'm the, I'm the youngster in the group, so I've watched these guys as they played, and uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not ashamed to say Arthur Carrington was in, in idol for us when we were coming up. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a joy and pleasure for me to be on the same podcast with him talking about history that he made and that I witnessed. So um, I'm just very excited to be here. Perfect. And so meeting each and every one of you at different times, the one thing uh, Marvin Dent informed me is that you have to read up on your history. You have to know about what's happening in, in the sports world and, and tennis as a whole. So ladies and gentlemen, Marvin Dent. Well, thank you. Uh, Bob mentioned starting rather late. The very first ball I ever hit, I was 18 years old, heading for football practice. And on a dare, I was told, I bet you can't do this, think you think you're so good at everything. I walked on a clay court with football shoes on and hit the first ball so perfectly. I've been trying to hit that same ball for six years. So uh, um, I had a chance to uh, experience a whole new life that uh, Arthur kind of grew up in. And I was fascinated by the existence of something called the American Tennis Association. Uh, I was equally fascinated by uh, all the celebrities that I got to know over the years, uh, I, I got to do some ambassadorship for uh, Arthur Ashe, uh, going to a couple different countries, helping him to develop the uh, Davis Cup scene so they could play in the Olympics when they found out that tennis was going to be uh, a medal sport. 
Uh, I was a high school coach. I was a college coach. Uh, I was 20 years the interceptional coach for the interception of USCA. And, uh, I've uh, met a lot of wonderful along the way, including just these two gentlemen we're talking about. Thank you so much, Marvin. And so we're going to just start with some rapid fire. We know that you all play tennis and you have a wealth of knowledge, as I mentioned. So we're going to start with Art. Art, what do you think the tennis industry can do to make the sport more inclusive? Well, first of all, you know, it has to be more visible. So, you know, you need more models. You need you know, you need the game to be seen in places where a diverse community exists. So one of the places is public parks. Um, and I, I think that uh, showing good tennis, because people don't know what good tennis is until they see good, you know, you got to show. So they have to be able to be exposed to good tennis and then uh, follow up to that. You know, it's, it's good coaching and uh, community programs. I'm a believer in community community small community clubs in that's what make that's what makes the game grow that's what made the american tennis association individuals that were enthusiastic and wanted to share their enthusiasm in a small way and that's what grew into the you know american tennis association so i'm really into community tennis i know bob bynum like he said since he picked up a racket and back in the day we had a very strong tennis community in the newark elizabeth and throughout New Jersey area, as well as New York. It was a, you know, a really strong community-based tennis programs that allowed him to. Now we don't have the community base. We have families that excel in a high performance competitive arena, but we really don't have the strong community programs that we once had. So, you know, that's that's kind of we need that strong community to grow the game. Right, you have to have that foundation, right? So the foundation right. in the parks is key. And that's one of the goals of this podcast is to interview people from the communities we're celebrating during our Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, DE&I Heritage Month, because you've lived this, you've seen tennis from, you know, over the years and with, you know, coming in a post pandemic world, tennis is just exploding. And, and you know, it, it's become a little bit more diverse, you know, despite the stereotypes that exist, you know, tennis being a rich white leisure sport and activity. So have you seen change? Um, and I'll take this to Bob. Bob, have you seen change um, for tennis to become more inclusive? Uh, I do, but, I, I, you know, there's certain aspects of it that I think we need to focus more on if we're going to uh, particularly have young people young people coming into the game one of the things that i noticed is is coaching okay we have a lot of programs and a lot of grants and funding opportunities for players but not necessarily for coaches and i think when i came up as a kid i had a wealth of coaches to that i saw on a daily basis every time i went to a ata event and and now you don't have that as much particularly in areas where kids can't really afford to go to private clubs and things like that but there are play, uh, folks who are looking, who really would like to help these kids, but they need some type of support as coaches in order to do that. Um, I know myself, I give back, uh, well, God knows how much over the years, but I was able to do that because I've had my own business. I was able to, to, to support myself and that kind of thing in addition to what I was doing. But there's a lot of coaches out there that don't have that, but are very capable, are very willing but they need that, that financial support in order to be able to devote the time that's needed, again, in those areas where, where players don't have access to, um, to coaching. And I think that would do a lot to bring more young kids and particularly kids of color into the game. But it's really just enticing their minds and really getting them excited about you know coaching. And you know what? I too can become a coach. And so I would ask the three of you, have you had you know, any mentors in the, in the, you know, black mentors or just mentors in general in the tennis industry that, that help inspire you to make you who you are today. So Art, we're going to start with you. Did you have any mentors? 
Of course, I wouldn't be, you know, definitely I had mentors. Uh, <laughs> my coach was Sidney Llewellyn, who was Althea Gibson's coach. So okay. from the time I was 12 years old, I saw tennis uh, presented on a, a very high level, you know, and from black Americans, because uh, Mr. Llewellyn, you know, was the consummate pro and he dressed the part, looked the part, and he, you know, can talk to, talk it. So he had all the ingredients that attracted me to the game. Um, the image of the game, like you, the, the game has image. Um, I talked to Marvin, it's, it's not presented in, a, in an athletic way enough. I don't, I don't think the game is presented athletically in a way in which the community that you want to attract, that, that real athlete, you know, um, like when I go to tennis facilities, they don't have a heavy bag. Tennis is a striking sport, but we don't present it like it's a it's as close to boxing as you can get. But people think it's a softy game. How do you get something that is so whole body demanding and uh, explosive and see it as, you know, a, a wimpy type game? So it's not presented the right way because people see the average high school tennis player picks up a racket as the season starts and puts the racket down at the end of the season. So the football players, the basketball players, the guys that train year round in athletics, when they see uh, the high school tennis team, traditionally they see somebody that just picks it. That's an A student, honor student, picked up the racket before the season, played a little and then put it down. I think so, so when you go to a tennis pro, he doesn't have tools that, that make you feel like you're in a, a training facility as well as a as a tennis facility. You need athletic environment. You need, we don't have environment. And so basketball players, they have a culture. They have environment. We don't have that in tennis. And so the music it is it's completely different, different setting. And um, it's not one that I grew up where it was a black tennis club. Bob grew up where it was a lot of black tennis players. I would have never got to tennis if I had to be bussed out into a program. If I had to leave my community and my boys, because they learned tennis too, Ed a laser and guys that I grew up with, you know, went to school with, they learned, ten we learned tennis together. So having to go somewhere, you know, is a whole different, different trip. So my, my, I, my students, my, I turn my students' parents into assistants. They're the ones that feed balls and know a lot about tennis. I train the parents. I believe in a highly educated parents will help. That's what helps build players. Fantastic. And we're going to go over to Marvin. Marvin, have you had a black mentor or a mentor in your lifetime? Well, the first, um, I was fascinated by basketball and football growing up in the South. And I was surprised to find out that the basketball coach I admired and the football coach I admired both played tennis. And um, when I actually made the team at North Carolina Central University, not even clear on how to keep the score, but uh, all the other sports I played uh, helped me, except not really understanding. So the coach there, Coach Young, um, he saw things in me that I didn't in myself. And I was just totally fascinated when I found out that uh, other black people played and were very good. And uh, once moving to the North, uh, I too spent many, many hours with Coach Sidney Llewellyn and Althea Gibson listening and learning. And so uh, I've even best part of my experience now has been mentoring young people or to give back to what was given to me. And as, as Arthur mentioned, mentoring is a big, big deal. I mean, we both could spend a lot of time giving names of people who passed on or inspired us to uh, do things that we thought we probably would never have been experienced on our own. So internship and, and mentoring is really, really a big part of developing coaches in this game. See, I thought tennis was a black game because I came up with this, in a small black tennis club that Althea Gibson came to, that uh, another person by the name of Nana Davis Vaughn, she was a finalist to Althea Gibson in 1948 in the women's division of the ATA. I had all kinds of uh, tennis players that came through. And so I thought tennis was a black game. I hadn't seen any white tennis players first i never saw a white I, same player. thing with me i came my first I two years I did, not, I did not even know white yeah. white people played tennis yeah <laughs> and so i know the environment bob came up in was, we had a strong environment and 
um, as a result, I didn't feel like I wasn't supposed to do this. It, I didn't feel like tennis was, it was something I wasn't supposed to do. I just, I, it, I was an anomaly. I realized after I started stretching out and I had a tennis game and I could go places and tennis took me to tournaments and whatnot. At that point, then, you know, it's like you realize people are always asking, who are you? How'd you get this way? And so that's what kind of inspired me to put my book together because people knew nothing about the American Tennis Association. I think it's real important for us to know our history so that we don't know how connected we were traditionally to tennis. Most people don't know that. And so you, you gotta have a way of showing that. And so, um, you know, that's, that's, that's where I'm at. And actually, I'm to that we I was, so, go ahead. I was surprised that, um, I may be even a little upset that I had not been exposed to the game. And I only found out rather late that the game was laughed at as being uh, 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 not a game for athletes. And I found the learning curve for tennis is much higher than in any other sports. So uh, uh, that was an image that I had to overcome. And I was a bit annoyed that so many people thought it exists pick up bracket and go out there, you were quite, didn't matter how much talent you had, that talent had to be turned into a skill first. Um, but I want to go back to Bob for a second, because Bob, you mentioned earlier that you are the young, you're the youngin on this all-star team we have here. And so, you know, you, we, we've heard from Marvin and Art about, you know, their mentors. And so I'm assuming that they're also your mentor. And so how are you paying it forward and mentoring others? Well, you know, when I was a kid, we, we, I had a lot of mentors because back then I played all ATA tournaments. I travel, I was fortunate enough to be able to travel to some of them. And back then we had all different styles of play. You didn't see, it wasn't everyone played the same way, a little bit like how it is now. But back then there were different styles of play. And I would just observe this because the other advantage I had as a youngster was I played mostly with adults. So I didn't really grow up with a lot of kids in my neighborhood playing tennis. I hung out with the adults. And so I had to get smarter, faster. I was never going to be able to play on court one and not on court four. I wanted to play on court one where everybody was watching, not on court four where nobody was watching. And in order to do that, I had to get smarter and, and had to learn a lot quicker than I might have had if I had played with just junior players. So in addition to these two, the other two uh, uh, great professionals on this call, you know, I snuck and, and was able to listen to Sidney Llewellyn talk speaking at times and, and uh, uh, a lot of other guys who, who I snuck around to, to hear what they had to say and tried to apply it without necessarily being taught what I was hearing. But, hey, I took with my interpretation, and did the best I could. Uh, hey, Bob, I think, speak I, to the, uh, Bob, speak to the class of people, because, you know, you are a, a city Newark kid from off the streets of Newark. Mm -hmm because of the, the quality of people that were around, the, the black doctors and lawyers and school teachers and all the successful African-American people that we had around. I, I saw Bob as a kid. I know that it was the cream of no crop that he came up under adult wise and same with me. We had an opportunity to spend mm -hmm. a lot of time with adults because tennis was an adult game at that time. And so, you know, didn't have programs that were dedicated to just junior tennis players. You got to tennis because you had a healthy black adult environment. And then that created your junior opportunities. The every ATA club back in the day was committed to a junior program. That was just, that was the way that was. So, you know, Bob came up in a really good time when it was still strong in Newark. And then they followed mm -hmm. up with the Ash Bolletary program in Newark. And so, um, you know, like I said, New Jersey was a same thing with Plainfield, New Jersey. It was a lot of opportunity for tennis, young black tennis players in New Jersey. And it, also the advantage of that is that it's very, it became very natural for me to give back when I got in a position to be able to do so. And and because that's all I had experienced in my in, in my tennis upbringing was people who were willing to help me to get, you know, to get further along in this game. And so it was natural for me to help others as, as I came across juniors and, and, and even some young adults who also wanted to get further ahead in this game. So for me, giving back, mentoring was really a very natural transition. I started coaching tennis two years after I started playing. 
uh, and I started working with adults, which again is unusual. Usually you start out working with children and I started working out with adults. So I had to be a little bit more uh, knowledgeable, a little bit more sophisticated about what I did because I was dealing with, with, with older people. And again, when it came time to do, to work with younger kids, my philosophy has always been, I'm working with you in order for you to get better. And that came from my ATA experiences. So uh, it, you know, on, the, on the subject of mentoring, it's, it's something I'll always do. It's something everyone on this call has done and will always do because that's how we were brought up. One, there's an interesting dynamic going on here. Um, as, as you've learned from Art and Bob, the community they came up in, uh, in North Carolina, there were a lot of historically black colleges and universities where uh, that nurtured developing a middle class. So and, and Art actually moved to South to go to college. And so he took, he learned tennis in the community and went South when finding out that a lot of the players he played were playing from these schools. Uh, he, he went to Hampton, but he played North Carolina Central and Durham. And Durham and a lot of the schools there were Winston Salem. They were part of Johnson C. Smith and Charlotte. These schools were played a large part in developing um, the tennis environment for aspiring middle class uh, aspirants. That's fantastic. No, thank you. I think it's very important for us to know where we, where we came from so that we can know how to push forward. And now racket sports in general over the past three years has been on the rise. It's really, um, when we were all in the pandemic, it was one of the only sports that people can actually play. Um, and that really, um, I think, energized people because they couldn't play basketball, you couldn't play baseball, but there was tennis. And so, you know, how do you, how do you see uh, tennis? Do you see it as a um, competitor uh, against the other sports. You know, Art mentioned like you really have to have, you know, game operations, cheerleaders, exciting, you know, um, music playing on the court. How do you infuse and really excite this generation? Um, is it by having additional game operations? Um, and what are your thoughts on that? You know, like you have the Harlem Tennis Center. You you need environments that attract the kids in there. You can't just it's got to be athletic because you you first of all we're speaking to high performance tennis i'm really better off saying that we need to grow tennis from a healthy standpoint and my experience has been where there's a lot of adult tennis players there you get junior tennis players so that that that's mm -hmm. been my main experience just trying to go as a junior program is that's a nut that's that's the new wave because traditionally tennis was middle class, like Bob was saying, and we had these adults and we got to the game from adults. So when you talk about just an all junior, then I'd say, well, okay, who's going to pay for the rackets to get strong? You know, when you, if you just go out to the public courts, I mean, tennis is a costly game. Kid comes out he pops his racket. What does he do with it? Who strings the racket? You know what I mean? So we didn't have that at Bob and I, we had adults and we had a way of all of that. But if you just, once you go just, and you just want to get this population of kids, because it seemed like they've been trying to get a population of, they're trying to take tennis and make it something like basketball, like AAU or something. They got this dream that they're going to go out and get all these kids that are going to just play tennis urbanly, urban kids. <laughs> so I'm saying, well, you know, what about the equipment? What about the indoor time? What, you know what I'm saying? Those are all my considerations that are, that are for real, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, when I when I listen to the the commentators on a match that Coco's playing in, if they're talking about Coco not having the right kind of forehand, <laughs> then what do you think is gonna be going on, you know, in a public park mm -hmm. that doesn't have all of the components that you need <clears throat> to be good, you know, so. Um, now, do you modify you your teaching style or coaching style to depending on the child or depending on their background, like how do you, you, you mentioned the forehand, right? How do you, mod do right. you modify your coaching style based on, well, you know? Well, Marvin and I speak and Bob, and, you know, we speak and we talk about, you know, like how do you coach large groups of people? First of all, <coughs> most coaches are only want to coach a small group. They think, oh, four kids and one coach. What school teacher has four kids? You understand mm -hmm. a tennis coach got it. You understand what I mean? Come on. How are we going to go to a game where our experts can only teach two guys that are, world ranked and they think they're doing something 
So to me, you need to be able to have a program where you can, you know, operate with 50 kids and, and have a method that allows a good technique and good stroke production to come out of that environment. So, so you need knowledgeable coaches. Now, where do you get these knowledgeable coaches? So, you know, that's, that's, that's what you need. You need knowledgeable coaches and, um, and you need strong recreational programs with adults because then those adults become supporters. That's who took Bob Bynum to tournaments. The adults, not another kid in the program who was a poor guy like him. <laughs> that's, not, that's not how we moved out. And so you need uh, uh, to grow tennis in the health capacity is good overall for the community. You know, that's why the move, uh, Ash's documentary, Citizen Ash, it's all about citizenship. That's what it is, creating an opportunity to have more productive citizens like what you have with Bob did. We pay taxes and you know saying we took tennis to another whole level at, of opportunity. So I think you need to expose guys like Marvin and us. That, you know, like um, I see so many things going on that 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 we're trying to do with we say a black community and and we just overlook the guys that have done the work and that have been there. We, you know, some kind of way. We get overlooked, and then you want to go into a community, and it's not, it's, you're not going in, in with the strength of the community. Is that it's why you wrote your book? Is that why you wrote your book, Black Tennis, African American Tennis Pioneers? Is that was one of the, is nobody that knows our history. They never seen it in the newspaper. You're a youngster. You never saw black sports. They never saw uh, the Amsterdam News. They never saw the Pittsburgh Courier at an Afro newspaper. So they need to know that this is what we came from, that there was no coverage of black sports. <laughs> you understand? Other than going to our media. When I was in high school, Marvin is talking about, he's from North Carolina. We all had a black newspaper come to our houses. If you read, you had black newspaper. Right. right? So I would sit in New Jersey reading about all these Southern black kids that played high school tennis because they went to segregated schools. They didn't integrate the schools in Virginia. Didn't get integrated until 1968. I graduated from high school in 1965. When I went to Hampton, it was still legal segregation with the schools. They were all segregated. And so that was a whole different of world of, you know, so we, it, like mom said in the South, we had college tennis, tennis on the college campus in the North. We had tennis in little small private clubs in public parks that we could go to where a kid in North Carolina couldn't go to the same public park. So, um, hmm. you know, facilities and good. Historically, the certifying agencies actually only taught for preparing pros for private clubs. So um, I had a long discussion once with Ash who wanted me to join the USPTA. And I said, they don't address my community. And then he said, well, they actually need you more than you need them. And hmm. as Arthur mentioned earlier, is that when they're teaching you to have four on the court and we need to have the expertise to manage 13, 14, 15, 16, 20 people on the court and make them have fun. And uh, yes, we introduce music. We, we can't imagine having a session without our music. Ironically, there's a story in the latest Sports Illustrated about the swimming coach at Howard University, who was formerly the tennis coach, putting music and cheerleaders on the sidelines to build his program. So I don't know whether you got the cheerleaders from, but it's actually happening in our community. It does. It does work, and uh, we. Need well, that's what we had when I was at Hampton. <laughs> hey, I know when I played in Hampton, it was like Chile. I mean, you know what I mean. It was a whole different world than when I played in Europe. So for me, uh, going from Hampton University to uh, born Miss England was a, a journey that was so demanding mentally that it was just unbelievable to be traveling in Europe in 1970 and 1971. I, I was at. Off with Arthur Ashe and Roland Garros and just told him, listen, this is not the life for me. I, I, you know what I mean? I just wasn't, you, you never, socially, you had no life at that time. You, so, you know, right. for, yeah. for those people out there, tell us a little, from your mouth, tell us where, where you played, some of the major tournaments, and your maybe your fondest memory. Because I well, see you on social first media. Of all, when I was a freshman, when I was a freshman at Hampton, they used to take 
the top four or five black men and put them straight into Forest Hills, which was the U.S. Open at the time. So when I was 19 years old, that's what they did. I used to say it was like a public lynching at times, you know what I'm saying? Because we'd have any practice on grass courts or anything, but they like, okay, this is our integration. We're going to let you play in the national championships at Forest Hills, right? Never practice on a grass court. You understand? So, you know, that was one thing. But my fondest memories are when major schools would come through Hampton on their Southern tours. And when I would go to NCAA regional events, so I was a finalist in the NCAA Atlantic Coast Championship in 1966 at Colgate. They had never had a black team come up there. I lost the number one player in America as a junior player, Armstead Neely. In the finals, I could have transferred anywhere to any school I wanted to almost. But Hampton was the place that, because I found that there were other places, Lewis Glass, there were other guys that went to UCLA and places when I went to Hampton, they didn't end up as, as fortunate as I did. The kind of mentors that I had at HBC was totally different than what my brother had at Rutgers in 1966. And so um, I was fortunate going back to that. I came up in an environment where it was important to, for people to nurture people. I had another mentor, Dr. William Haling, Dr. Bill Haling. He was a gynecologist that birthed 8,000 babies. Mayor Dinkins included. I used to be with Mayor Dinkins and him at the 18. He was a giant. And he mentored us in his house. He had hunting dogs. He moved up to the hill in South Orange from High Street in Newark. And, you know, so like the kind of people I was around, the kind of giant black people I was around made me feel incredible. And so when people would ask me where I got started, just like you asked me, I needed the book for them to see. You need This book needs to be seen by more people because it's the only book that talks about the AT National Championship and shows the media. It's an archival collection on purpose. It's not meant to tell the story of Arthur Ashe or Alte. It's meant to, to show the story of where we came from, where Bob Bynum came from, where John Lucas came from, where Bonnie Logan in North Carolina came from, where Bill Davis came from in New York. So the story of us black tennis players, nobody knows, but there's two statues at the U.S. Open, Arthur Ashe and Althea Gibson, but they don't know about the Cosmopolitan Tennis Club. They don't know about Shady Rest. They don't know about the Algonquin Club in Durham, North Carolina. They don't know Sam Jones, a Hall of, America, a, a Hall of Fame basketball player at University from North Carolina Central was a tennis player. They don't, they don't know that Air Sage, who was on the Harlem Renaissance and is in the Basketball Hall of Fame, was the ATA national champ and was in the final several times. So we don't know our history. And that's where we need the USDA to help out because we, we, needed to, we needed to expose that we have this illustrious history in tennis that nobody knows. Well, that's why Dwight we're here. Dwight Davis, Dwight Davis, the, the name of the, 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 the competitions there. <laughs> He actually officiated a match in the finals, in the 18 finals. Or 1921. Dwight Davis, the founder of Davis Cup, went to the ATA Nationals in 1921 in Washington, D.C., and umpired the semifinal match. And then shortly thereafter, he founded the National Public Parks part of the USTA just so he could get African Americans and, and others that were left out of the USTA in. In 1948, um, the National Public Park champ Oscar Johnson was 1948, and Doug Sykes, who played number one for Cal Berkeley in 1960, was National Public Park Championship. So we, we, the, the history is not known, and you youngsters that are, you know, kind of know it in order to promote and expose. And again, that's where it comes back to the book because the book is the only way to really expose our our history at. Unfortunately, we don't have, we don't have, I didn't have a book. Marvin and us, we didn't have a book as youngsters. I can remember meeting Marvin in about 1966 in New England uh, at the American Tennis Association New England Championship. And what, that was larger than the Nationals, right, Marvin? Absolutely. It was I traveled amazing. my family to Xenia, Ohio. I traveled my whole family to Xenia, Ohio. To the, the, the what was the name? AJ the Nationals. Central? The ATN National. I dressed my whole family in dashikis. And it was like a glorious community. <laughs> yes, yes. Hey, you want to hear something funny? Won. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, Go ahead I, actually, I actually won Mr. ATA, a popularity contest. I couldn't believe 
You know, I'm like, I was getting ready to say that. I think Marvin was voted Mr. ATA at a talent show. That's so funny. We're going to do a quick round robin, okay? Because we know art has history. You know Bob and, and Marvin as well. Who's on your Mount Rushmore of tennis? Well, it's got to be Arthur Ashe and Althea Gibson. Okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then there's B.M. Clark, who was uh, eight, he came from Jamaica in, in uh, 1920 and won the ATA National Championship. And he was the first black man in 1923 to play at Wimbledon, 1923. He played, oh, no, I'm sorry, 1924, he played Wimbledon. And uh, he, so um, the first black didn't play Forest Hills to 1950. That was Althea. So he's a giant. And uh, we're going to let Bob and Marvin weigh in. Is there anyone you would like to add to that list? Well, I definitely, I mean, Arthur is, Arthur Ashe is the reason I got into tennis because I taught tennis uh, on a part-time basis until the Ash Boletary program came to Newark and we had a big meeting and, and, and a lot of part-time pros came to that meeting and Arthur told us all that we needed to have full-time commitment to this. And after the meeting, he comes up to me, says, so Bob, can I count on you? And I said, yeah. And I went home and told my then wife that, hey, I was leaving to go to make half the money in order to teach tennis because Arthur told me I needed to do it. So Arthur would definitely be up there for me. Uh, Althea Gibson would be up there for me. Uh, Silly Newellen would be up there for me because I learned a lot by being around him and how in, in terms of coaching style and what you need to look for. Um, so uh, though that's that would be my my mouth Rushmore. It, it, uh, so although we get, could put these two gentlemen on this on, on this on this call on there too now because could, the influence they've had over not just me but but no, uh, God knows how many other players uh, they both could be up on there too. Hey, well, I'm listening to what comes out of this. Is Dr. Johnson is in the Hall of Fame, but see when it really comes to the ATA way it used to be. The factions had to come together for Althea and Arthur to exist. So the Northern Blacks, the Northern West Indian community, and the Northern Southern and the Southern community came together on them. This was incredible and unusual for these for the kind of uh, coalition that we had. But at the same time, you hear Marvin speak up Sidney Llewellyn, you hear Bob speak up Sidney Llewellyn, you hear me. We all are Northerners. Dr. Johnson was not the number one on our list. I just thought I would bring that, yeah. you know, since we since it's happening like this, you, everybody's talking about Llewellyn. I wanted to be clear about the fact that depending on who you're talking to, how much uh, goes to. And then there's another great man, Dr. Eaton. Are you familiar with him? I'm learning. I'm, I'm, okay. I'm, Dr. Notes. I'm Listen, learning. Dr. Eaton is where Althea Gibson went from the ninth grade to the 12th grade in Wilmington, North Carolina to graduate from high school. But you don't know his name. You understand, know but everybody thinks that Dr. Johnson made out there, but out there went from New York, then she went to Wilmington, North Carolina, and went to high school from the time she was 18 to 22 years old. She didn't go to high school till she was 18, ninth grade, graduated at 22, and wow. then went to Florida AM. But Dr. Eaton was instrumental in this before that out there even graduated from Florida AM and then got cultivated, you know, like Dr. Johnson played more part in his life. So I just thought I'd point that out, that it really was a coalition of Northern Blacks, Northern Caribbean, and the Southern and West Coast that made the atmosphere that created Ash out there, you know, and the American Tennis Association. Fantastic. And so Marvin, you 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 talk about reading and, and reading a lot of books. So the hand, how it uses and shapes the brain, language, and human culture is a book that you recommended. What is your philosophy or mantra about, you know, utilizing your hand and taking care of your hand? When it... Well, well Denise, the hand is the connection to that instrument. We call it a racket, but I, I prefer to call it an instrument. And um, how we handle it is, is primal. Uh, to serve, uh, Coach Llewellyn used to talk about you should, should serve with belligerence because the initial action for serving was hunters and gatherers trying to capture food. So uh, its relationship to the hands, the, the most unique thing about the hand is the anthropological thumb, the opposing mm -hmm. thumb. 
it separated us when we left the trees to come back and walk upright. The thumb is perhaps the most unique advancement of the civilization. Perhaps we never would have advanced to the level we have unless we had this opposing thumb. And that's how the relationship there are. There's 360 degrees on the rackets, but there are eight different sides to it. And each side presents places another kind of experience. Well, uh, discovering that aspect of it is changes the whole life when you try to help young people. You just It's not a bat. Uh, it's not a round bat like a golf club or a baseball bat. It has unique purposes. And Marvin. to start someone not to understand the connection with their hands, it's unfair to them because that's this initial connection. I don't even like to talk about grips. I'm against the word grips because the grip is like you're going to hold it one way. No, no, no. You're asking the ball to adjust to you. But making it a, an instrument, you make music with it. And, uh, Marvin, where did uh, you hear? Where did you hear about that hands? Where did you come to the hands book? Uh, Arthur Carrington introduced in the handbook, and I gobble it up. <laughs> Listen, listen, Marvin and I, see, when I want to know something uh, about what I'm doing, I call Marvin to find the, the real inner side of what I'm doing. I'm like, this is what I'm doing, but what am I doing, Marv? <laughs> so, you know, like all of my nunchucks and Tai Chi fans and all of the different tools I use come down to the hand in the brain. So that's another thing that our students are very academic. We don't want to leave that out. Our students our high yeah. academic achievers, our coaching yeah. method puts them in a place where it, it just fits right with the high achievement student, the high performance person, not just a high performance Absolutely. athlete, I mean, high performance person, you know? So is, listen, I got to move on because I got to. We have five students. And so um, as we, we have five students. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just say, we, it assumes we have five senses, and it's not true. We have nine. And of those nine, the hands and the eyes play a major, major role. And without that connection, you're raising the learning curve of any other perspective. Fantastic. And so as we get ready to close, I would like you to just leave us with your final words. We'll start with Art. Please give us your final words and what you want people to know about your legacy and what you want to be known for. Well, my legacy, I love the game of tennis and I love community tennis. I love the starting point. So I, I learned the saying that the dot is in the infinity, but the infinity is in the dot. So, you know, just all you need is one little spark to start something that can grow into a life that I've, my mother had, I've had my son and my grandchildren. We've all had college tennis as a part of our life, fortunately, and a part of our life. So the healthy benefits of tennis is a life you know, so that that's, I think tennis is the greatest to me. <laughs> Thank you. And Bob? Um, I, I think community is the big thing that I see now between the difference I see between back when I, when I learned to play this game and now. And I think if we get back to that community aspect, I know in my programs, there was, there is no high court, low court. We're all in it together, regardless of the program I'm running, whether it's beginners, juniors, advanced, uh, high performance, adults. And I think we need to get back to that. And I'm hope that, you know, when I you know, leave this earth, that that commute, that people will remember that, hey, they were part of the Bob Bynum community of tennis as opposed to just tennis, because that's how I came up. And it, it's worked for me. And that's my fondest memories of the game is those, those, those communal interactions that, that I experienced when I was a kid. Thank you. And we're going to round it out with Marvin. Mark Twain said the two great days in your life is the day you were born and the day you figure out why. And when I figured out that my greatest joy comes from being of service. So for me, I aspire to inspire before I expire. Gentlemen, Art, Bob, Marvin, on behalf of USTA Eastern, I want to thank you for sharing your tennis stories with us. I look forward to you becoming extensions of our department and educating me as we go. I have so much to learn about diversity, equity, and inclusion within USTA Eastern and the history of African-Americans in tennis. And this has been such a pleasure to be with you today. 
Great. Thank you. Until, enjoy it. Enjoy every yeah. minute of it. Pleasure being here. Good being with you guys, and we'll talk soon. We'll Bye, talk everybody. Definitely. All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, thank you for tuning in. We'd like to uh, ask for you to tune in with us for Women's History Month. And thanks for watching or listening to USTA Eastern Tennis Stories.